So hi everyone, uh, welcome to our taster uh, session. Uh, so my name is Zirana Khalife. Uh, I am a biochemist by training, and then I did my master's in cancer research. Uh, but then I realized that wherever the biology aspect of the things we study at university is not translated in real life, uh, that's why I did my PhD in biochemical engineering, um, more specifically in the regenerative medicine field. Because when I was searching for a degree, I, wa I was, to be honest, I was shocked to find a department in which collaborates with a lot of companies, industrial partners, and then work on a product that is already in the market or in the process to be in the market. Uh, so I finished that and then I've been teaching uh, in the department for the last five years approximately. I'm the regenerative medicine minor coordinator. So as part of the uh, engineering uh, faculty, the students can take a minor um, in different fields, in nanotechnology, in environmental science. One of the minor that we offer in our department is the regenerative medicine uh, minor. So I am the coordinator and lead on three modules in that. And I teach uh, some of the courses in, in UMSC that we started last year, which is, it has a long uh, title, but um, it's manufacturing and <laughs> Shola is laughing because Shola is uh, one of our MSc students. So manufacturing and commercialization of stem cells and gene therapy products. Um, so before I start my uh, sharing my screen, uh, I want Shola to introduce uh, herself. Okay, hi everyone. So as Rona said, I am doing the master's with a very long title at the moment, but I heard about this master's during my undergrad, which was also at UCL. I'm actually a chemical engineer by training, I guess you could say. And I did the regenerative medicine minor, which ran for the last two years of my undergrad. And from then I, I knew what I was interested in. It was not being a chemical engineer. So I um, applied to this master's and this is what I'm doing now. Yeah. Thank you, Shola. Shola will be here to answer any of your uh, question and maybe talk about her career path from chemical. Yeah, ask me loads of questions, guys. It's this is how you'll learn how to get into this stuff. You, there's no clear path, so there's no wrong questions and no wrong answers. Exactly. So today in my lecture, I'm not going to go over what uh, we offer as degree in our department. We'll go over this more in details, as Kim, Kim will mention, in the open days. And we have some taster uh, sessions, four taster sessions happening in July. If you're interested in, uh, you can apply uh, to attend. So um, UCL, why UCL? Uh, we just received some news today that we are, we're, uh, we're, we're number two uh, when it comes to uh, research um, as classification. Um, so we have disruptive thinking and the good thing about UCL is that you can collaborate between different departments. Um, they care about um, having diversity, having um, equality between all the staff and the students. So I have a lot, like many students come to me in the open days or taster session and ask me, what is biochemical engineering? What's the difference between biochemical and chemical engineer or biomedical engineer? And um, briefly, I can tell you that we're way different than the chemical engineer. Um, in terms of process, they care about, for example, uh, creating a device with for manufacturing. They care about how to calculate the speed of the rotation. But uh, with the biomedical engineering, they care about uh, implementing a new machine for diagnosis or prognosis. But for us as biochemical engineering, we are trying to combine the field of chemical engineering, biotechnology, biology, all of these aspects. Because for us, what's very important is how we can translate the knowledge of the biology students, the biology researchers and the engineers, and then we can translate it into real life. It's not that easy. So take the taking this kind of information and then doing it in the preclinical trials. So for example, before you release a product in the market, 
you have to test it on animal and then you have to go through clinical phases one, two, and three, test it on human beings and then release it. But it's not that easy because within the process, you have to think about if, for example, I am a company and I'm treating people with cancer, and this is one of the examples that I will be talking about, I'll be thinking, how am I going to produce this? Am I going to produce a product that can be taken by all the patient or I'm going to be more specific and do personalized medicine and treat patient by patient? Um, how long will this process take me? And the most important thing, where is my company based? If my company is based, let's say, in UK, they have to follow certain regulations. So there is a lot of regulations, aspect, legislation that we need to think about. So we combine all of this and even the cost of goods. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one of the examples of the cancer therapy. And mainly our role is how to decrease the cost. So not only how to translate this knowledge, how to reduce the cost of this therapy so everyone can take it. I'm going to define some, some key aspects that uh, we use in terms of bioprocessing or biochemical engineering. So we are based uh, in central London, uh, near Houston, approximately. And it's like a small department because um, we were within the chemical engineering and then we had a separate uh, department. Um, although we are a small department, we have a lot of uh, professors on board. And we're not only focused on one aspect or one field, as I will show you. So some of us are working on the vaccine. Uh, we're working on the collaboration with uh, AstraZeneca and Oxford Biomedica. Uh, some of us, like uh, Dr. Brenda is working on algae, how to produce bioethanol. Um, some of us are working on uh, synthetic biology. Um, and then maybe I'm biased to regenerative medicine. That's why I'm gonna focus more about this. Uh, we have um, Dr. Kasim Rafiq and then uh, Dr. Kent, uh, who is working also on the regenerative medicine aspect. But before going into the regen med, I want to define you that I told you, we're not doing anything in the lab that is small scale. That means like growing the cell in a small surface area, like 25 centimeters square. No, because this is what the biologists do. So what we're trying to do is we try to scale up. So the terms of scale up, that means instead of growing, let's say my cells, my human cells in a 25 centimeter square area, we're growing them into more kind of a bigger tanks that we called a bioreactor. So we deal with upstream. So let's say a company is doing, let's say um, antibodies production. And they tell us that we need to scale up our process. So instead of having 1,000 doses per batch, we want 10,000. So how can we do it? That's why we collaborate with them to optimize this kind of a process. And we deal with something called downstream. So when you, for example, grow your cells, but my antibody, let's say it's inside the cells. So how can we lyse these cells, purify these antibody? Uh, how we're gonna, well, when it comes to pharmaceutical drugs, you simply package it. But when it terms of, in terms of antibodies or human product or cell product or gene product, you have to preserve it at a certain temperature. And it's kind of have a half shell life. So all of these kind of challenges we're trying to optimize. Um, why, if you think about it, why you wanna become a biochemical engineer? If you're interested in biochemical engineer, the most important thing in any kind of study is to find a program that is not designed only to do lecture-based uh, uh, learning. Uh, we do a lot of scenarios, a lot of challenges with our students. Um, over here, we have our students in the lab and then in the parliament presenting their poster and they want it uh, as well. So we give our students kind of uh, this kind of feedback. Um, we bring a lot of industrial partner uh, to come attend their poster session to give them feedback and then tell them how it is like in the industry. Um, also, we have something called iGEM. Um, this is from two years, we want the gold medal. And then, um, so usually the students go to the lab, do their project uh, during summer, and then we fly them to Boston in October to present their work. It's an international competition, more than 2000 people there, more than 200 uh, team. So, um, 
we also, um, we have, a, as I mentioned, we have a lot of industrial partners that comes to visit our students during their poster session, and the research project or design project. And you can see where our collaborator works. And these are like very big companies in terms of the regenerative medicine field. Um, and it's nice to see that most of our uh, graduate students, when they finish, they go work to these companies. So whenever we have like a conference, we all see familiar uh, faces because we all have kind of like a good uh, community. So if you, if you are interested in studying uh, undergrad or postgraduate uh, biochemical engineering degree, uh, you can check our website um, or attend any of our open days or taster session where we will talk about more into details about it. But most of the people, uh, most of our students when they finish, uh, they have a lot of variety in terms of jobs. So some of them, they go to consultancy. Uh, some of them, they work in cell therapy uh, company, but within, for example, the cell therapy company, they can work as scientists, as process development um, or clinical trials. So we have a lot of uh, job variety after you finish your degree with us. And it's very important. And I wanna focus on the regenerative medicine bioprocessing because it's a growing sector and you're gonna see in a bit why. And um, we had a meeting with Catapult, industrial and academic meeting. And they were saying that we lack a lot of people with bioprocessing background, especially when it comes to cell and gene therapy. So they wanna recruit more and more uh, people because of this kind of a lack. If you're interested more in our degrees or the research that we do, uh, you can visit our website. We have links for the Vax Hub and the place, uh, Plastic Waste Hub and even the Manufacturing Hub. So I wanna talk, I wanna combine uh, the aspect of regenerative medicine with biochemical engineering and why it is important to be biochemical engineering um, in this field. So first, regenerative medicine is a, kind of newish term, uh, which combines, which reflects that you want to treat someone by replacing cells, by replacing a tissue or organ for that part of the damage area to restore its normal uh, function. And it's like very broad aspect. So you're gonna see me now presenting stuff about um, tissue engineering, about stem cell therapy, and then lastly, um, the hot topic nowadays, CAR T therapy, which is the newest uh, cancer therapy. Okay, so for tissue engineering, why we're interested in tissue engineering? Um, because there is, a, although there is a lot of people now uh, doing uh, organ transplantation, they're more aware of it. We're still having shortage um, in the UK. Not only that, if a patient is wait, uh, waiting for, let's say, lung transplantation, and then finally they have a donor, there is a high chance for this patient to reject that uh, because of immunohistocompatibility or immunorejection uh, as a foreign body. So the tissue, what we're aiming to is, what if a patient will come to us and say that they want, let's say, part of their heart uh, replacement. So what we do is usually we take cells from the patient or later on we can, we can speak about it when we talk about stem cell, um, grow them in the lab. And then when we have enough cells, we put them on kind of a 3D scaffold or uh, extracellular matrix to resemble the, um, the function of the tissue and then the shape of the tissue and then give it back to the patient. Um, as easy as it sounds, in every single step, you have a lot of challenges and a lot of decision to make. That's why although people have started tissue engineering more than 30 years ago, we still have a lot of challenges. Maybe the more advanced uh, tissue engineering related successful clinical trials are related to something that is very small instead of let's say liver uh, tissue engineering or heart tissue engineering because as the organ gets bigger you have more complex uh, challenges um, the most common one are the skin batches and you can you can see a lot of uh, skin batches in market 
um, you have some dental replacement for bone, uh, some cartilage replacement as well. And maybe nowadays, if someone has a cartilage uh, damage, uh, they do like kind of injection of uh, tissue engineering approach. Uh, the most successful clinical trial nowadays was for a trachea replacement. So this patient had uh, damage to her uh, trachea um, and then they did um, a trachea replacement uh, by doing tissue engineering, putting her cells on already existing trachea and then the, the patient was able to uh, breathe again um, and that was a really successful clinical trial. But doing it at a small scale, um, these are kind of live images. So they took, for example, in here, they took the trachea of the pig because it resembles the trachea of the human being. And then they decelerized it. That means they removed all the cells related to uh, the animal source. And they make sure that you don't have any contaminant because if you have any contaminant from animal source and you give it to the patient, this will fail and the patient will have adverse effect. So they did this and then they put the, um, the patient's cells on it. They grow it in the lab, as you can see over here in the roller bottle. And then once the, uh, the patient's cells are um, occupied the whole surface, they give it to the patient, of course. This is kind of a small lab in which you can see that the person um, has a mask, has everything because it's GMP compliant. So GMP means good manufacturing process. You have to be in a really clinical room to make sure that you don't have any contaminant. Uh, plus the trachea has to be on time. Um, I remember in one of the cases, the, the, the uh, regulations approval from the regulate the papers uh, from the regulatory oh the regulatory body approval was not on time so they couldn't do the transplantation so you have to start from scratch now another topic we're interested in and uh, we do a lot of research in our department is stem cell therapy so i don't know um, your knowledge about stem cells but i will try to cover as much as i can um, I don't know if you know these people as well. Maybe the most famous one is the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012 um, for discovering something that I will explain a little bit. So usually um, embryonic stem cells or what we refer to pluripotent stem cells are kind of like in mother cells. What does that mean? That means once we differentiate them in the lab, they can give rise to any cell type in your body. Now, in the early days, back in 1988, uh, 1998, Thompson was the first to isolate these embryonic stem cells from human embryo. And usually we isolate them from the inner cell mass of blastocysts, which is at early division of the fertilized egg. So when they did this, everyone was rushing into stem cells doing stem cell research, but then the stem cell research was stopped because of all of the ethical debate. Because although in some of the cases, uh, these embryonic stem cells, they were taken from IVF babies or, um, or miscarriage, there was a lot of ethical debate uh, in that. Um, so the research for stem cell has stopped till 2007, where um, Yamanaka discovered that you can take any nucleated cells in your body, reprogram it to become pluripotent stem cells. By doing this, we're, go we're overcoming a lot of challenges. So you have pluripotent stem cells, you can differentiate it into any cell type in your body, and then you give it to the patient. So by doing this, not only, for example, when we had embryonic stem cells and then we differentiate them into, let's say, neuron and give it to the patient, the patient might reject that because it's not from his own body. But by discovering what Yamanaka did, and then they call it induced pluripotent stem cells or IPS, that means if a patient wants, let's say, neuron, you can take a skin, a skin cell from him, reprogram it to become IPS, and then differentiate these IPS into neuron, 
and give it back to the patient. So this is what we call autologous therapy. That means it's from patient to patient. So there is no ethical debate and there is no immuno rejection, but a lot of disadvantages. Uh, the process timing, it takes approximately one month to um, reprogram. Most of the differentiation protocol can take from few days till month. Then you have purification and then give it back to the patient as long as the cost of the therapy itself. It has been more than 10 years since the IPS discovery and we're using IPS to different things. So doing clinical trials, not only that, we can use it to test, for example, the effect of different drugs. So let's say, um, let's say Parkinson disease, the, the patient suffer from uh, damaged neurons. Uh, and then what we can do is we can take uh, cells from the patient reprogram it to become IPS and then differentiate them again, and then study the effect of different drugs on the cell behavior. The first clinical trial that happened was in 2014 uh, in Yamanaka Center. So Yamanaka has a, a center in, at Kyoto University uh, called Saira Center. And they did their first uh, uh, clinical trial in 2014 uh, where a, a patient uh, suffered from a loss of her vision. So what they do, what they did is they took uh, cells, they reprogrammed to become pluripotent stem cells, and then they differentiated um, into, um, into the cells and then give it back. And then uh, the woman was recovering. Not only that, recent clinical trials, we have a lot of clinical trials, as I will show you in a bit, happening. Um, and then they did the first clinical trial for Parkinson's disease a few years ago as well. Um, so as, as you can see over here, most of the clinical trials happening for stem cell therapy, more uh, pluripotent stem cell therapy to, uh, to target diseases like AMD, macular degeneration. Um, you have uh, diabetes as well, heart failure and Parkinson's disease. Another hot topic is the CAR therapy, CAR T therapy. So um, I don't know if you are on Twitter. Uh, nowadays, if you just type CAR T therapy, Emily uh, Whitehead uh, on Twitter, you can see a lot of news because two days ago, we, are, we were marking the 10 uh, years uh, cancer free for Emily. Uh, so she's celebrating 10 years uh, of cancer fee. And then over here, you can see her. Uh, she was the first patient in the world to have received this kind of therapy. I will talk about it in a bit. And then over here, this is Aisha. And then she received the first um, CAR T therapy in 2015 um, at ICH. So basically, when it comes to CAR therapy, when they have started it, they started it on a blood uh, cancer, such as, uh, such as leukemia and uh, other uh, type of cancer. So what they take is usually they take the blood cells from the patient. Uh, more specifically, we're interested in the T cells because they are the one who fights against cancer. We, modi we genetically modify it to express certain receptor or certain thing on, on its membrane. And then we give it back to the patient and this should go specifically to the cancer and attack it and kill it, uh, which is good. Um, there, is a lot of mod um, there is a lot of symptoms happening uh, when the patient have received this, but as I showed you, Emily now is celebrating uh, 10 years of cancer free uh, without, any, uh, without relapsing. So if this is happening, what do you think could be the challenge or the problem? You can type it in the chat if you want. What do you think the challenge in this therapy? Any idea? Okay, basically, 
it's the cost of it okay so the first two product in the market were Kimria and Yiscarta and approximately these uh, products cost between 377 to 475 thousand dollars so can you imagine uh, the cost of it uh, finding specific receptor to targets already they already find the receptor but it's more about the cost of the process um, so these were the first two uh, products in market but nowadays we have a lot of uh, we have more than five products in market to treat uh, leukemia um, or blood cancer and then we have more uh, clinical trials phase one or preclinical trials targeting solid tumor so most of these products that are now in the market can treat blood cancer but now what if we can treat the um, solid tumor so there is clinical trials happening to treat brain, renal, prostate, and ovarian cancer, um, and so on. So what is our role as biochemical engineering? So we're trying to see that usually these kind of products are patient to patient. So it's personalized medicine. So they take the blood from the uh, patient uh, himself or herself, and then reprogram it and give it to him. So there is a if there is a product in the market that do allogeneic uh, treatment. That means you have one product that can be given to many patients at the same time. So this is how we interfere. So how can we make this kind of allogeneic? How can we scale up or scale out and then reduce the cost of um, this therapy? So this is briefly what we do in our department regarding regenerative medicine. Um, so I think we can answer some of the questions now. Okay, so I will start with the first one. Uh, do we also learn uh, gene editing? I mean, if it's part of your undergraduate degree, you mean, um, some of the module can, um, can teach you this. Uh, if you take the regenerative medicine uh, module, we will go over the... Uh, gene therapy as well. Uh, as part of our new MSc, we cover uh, gene um, editing, or I would, I would rather call it uh, gene therapy uh, more. I would like to know what cell modification are currently available to reduce the inflammatory cytokine storms in the, product, in the production of CAR-T therapy. This is a good question. So um, for those who are not familiar, when we give this kind of CAR-T cells to the patient, uh, because of the T cells release a lot of cytokines, um, it's a great challenge. And then sometimes, for example, with Emily, they had to put her into a coma to reduce her temperature because of the cytokines inflammation. Um, nowadays, what they're trying to do is when they try to build this kind of TCR receptor, they try to put a switch on, switch off uh, kind of uh, gene. Uh, to tell the body when to turn on this car, uh, this TCR, and when not to reduce the inflammatory of the cytokines, and they're trying to change the because when they start, they start building the receptor. You have three different generations so far, so they always try to modify uh, the receptor um, for that. Why there is such massive cost when developing such therapy? Uh, this is a good question. Um, most of these therapy, they are autologous. That means from patient to patient, which increase the cost of the process. That means you have to always optimize and validate your process. So when dealing with the human cells, you never know their behavior. Um, so although you have to create a robust bioprocessing in which you know Step one, I'm gonna expand for two days. Step two, I'm gonna modify it. Dealing with the human cells, you never know. Sometimes you have to expand it for more, which can change the process. And after each process, um, in terms, if I'm in manufacturing uh, and in industry, I have to clean and everything. Not only that, we use a lot of um, antibodies and other stuff, interleukins that are very expensive. And maybe one of the, uh, common cost is when we genetically modify these cells, we usually use a lentivirus and even the production of lentivirus is high. So everything builds into 
this massive uh, cost. Uh, Shola, feel free to interfere. Shola just had the presentation and she was pitching that she was an industry um, building a CAR T product and she was pitching this into our industry. So part of our new MSC is that we have on board, we have people from industry uh, coming to, to teach our students or to, to tell them what's happening, to give them advices, um, which, is, which is a good thing, I guess. Could lab create organ ever realistically remove the need for people to become organ donor? We will still have shortage. <laughs> I mean, this is an interesting question. Um, we still have shortage, I think. And one of the challenge is, so let's say I'm building a, an industry um, to create hearts for people. How long I can preserve these hearts at which temperature to be viable for the, for the, for the patient? And it, when it comes to tissue engineering, it also depends on when the patient needs it. If it's immediate, maybe I will go to organ donation um, rather ha than having to wait in the lab to do this. Um, also, you have to think about it. We have a lot of regulation and legislation. Uh, if I'm based here, will the FDA allow me to give this to the patient or it's safer to give them from other donors? If this field applied on Alzheimer or on the brain in general and how. So the clinical trials that I've mentioned in Syra Center, they were doing it on patients who uh, suffered from Alzheimer. So they were uh, differentiating these stem cells into gabaminergic, uh, dopaminergic, sorry, uh, neuron, um, and then give it specifically to these patients. CAR T therapy seems very interesting. I would like to know what are the main obstacles related to CAR T with recall to solid tumor, like with lung cancer, maybe. Shola? I mean, yeah, I just presented an alternative to this, so I can, I can go ahead. So the issue with solid tumors, it's actually very straightforward. If you think about it, when the CAR T success was with leukemia, which is a blood cancer, if you don't know, so access to your blood is very simple from a therapeutic standpoint, but for a solid tumor, you're trying to access an enclosed like unit for a tumor. So yes, you can get to the outside of it, but how do you actually get into the tumor and cure the root of the disease? So they're looking for specific targets. They're looking at different ways of getting into the cells. You can look up um, exosomes. That's a pretty interesting way of doing it. But I think the current focus for solid tumors is trying to find the right target for the right type of cancer that you're focusing on. So for lungs, I think it's, um, it's a tyrosine receptor related target that they're looking at at the moment. But yeah, if you have a quick Google, honestly, it's very, very interesting because everyone is focusing on um, different targets. And the, the, I think the scope of the field is expanding so, so quickly. There's a lot out there that you could actually look into and find out more about. Or alternative, I'm just going to plug the work I just did. What we've described is the ex vivo manufacturing protocol. So starting with the patient's own cells, you edit the cells, you infuse them back into the patient. What people are now starting to look at is in vivo manufacturing. So you actually insert a vector, very similar to how the vaccine works, into your patient. And within the patient's body, it will form the CAR T cells because a CAR construct can just be carried in and then put onto your T cells. I'm simplifying it a lot but it's a whole new field of CAR-T manufacturing. So yeah, very interesting. I mean, as, as Shona mentioned, it's going super, in this field, everything is going super fast. When I started in 2014, we were working on stem cells. And nowadays, most of the funds are heading toward lentivirus, virus production, scaling, reducing the cost of it, and then CAR. And then we started with CAR on leukemic, on blood cancer, now we're thinking about how to create it off-shelf allogeneic to treat many uh, patients at the same time. Now we're focusing on solid tumors, but as Shola mentioned, the, most of the challenge is how can you, because you're gonna infuse this into the blood, uh, into the patient blood. So how can you make sure when you infuse this into the patient blood that these T cells will go directly to the lung or 
to deliver. So you have to add something that kind of labels the, um, the T cells or kind of shift the direction to T cells and to directly uh, the lung. Okay, so um, what's the biggest problem in therapy of monoclonal antibodies? I think when it comes to monoclonal antibodies, maybe it's uh, one of the most advanced uh, things happening now. And you have a lot of product in market uh, because, because it's already known, it's producing antibodies and then uh, doing this bioprocessing and scale up and producing a lot of batches, uh, purifying it, give it to the, uh, having products in market, it's much easier than dealing with the cell because in the antibodies, you just, it's secreted out, you purify it. So you know that you can scale it, you can reduce the cost and you can give it to the patient. There is not a lot of uh, variation in the process. So I don't think they have a lot of uh, problems. Maybe the only problem is depending on which type of disease you are trying to, um, you're trying to treat. Um, if this kind of disease is, try, is changing epitopes a lot of times, that means you have to uh, redo the monoclonal antibody bio uh, processing. Cell and gene therapy had many breakthroughs, such as using AVB, IPS, and CAR T. But what would you predict the next big? <laughs> Interesting question. I mean, I mean, nowadays, because of what happened during the pandemic, most of the people are focusing on lentivirus. Um, and then most of the funds are heading towards the vaccine. Uh, we have a really nice uh, vaccine uh, research happening in our department. I think the next big breakthrough will combine lentivirus or gene therapy with CAR T. So maybe as Shola mentioned, how can you give something to the, to the patient, kind of like uh, a virus that has a specific plasmid to go and change uh, this kind of receptor on the T cells in your body um, and then fight against cancer. So I think this is the uh, biggest step that will happen next. Uh, do you have anything to add, Shola? I think I, uh, with that question, it's actually very interesting because you focused on the final product. I think it's not just the final product that we need to be considering. We need to be considering the development of technology. If you think about it, CAR T is a technology that is how you make this type of T cell and the different ways that the car constructs are made and then put onto the T cells. That is a whole technology platform in itself. And using AAV, that's a type of vector. There's so many different types of vectors out there. So I think it'll be very interesting to see if say we move away from viral vectors. I do think that's about 10 years in the future, but it is very interesting because you don't have all the associated issues of viral vectors. And then, for platforms, I mean, you named IPSCs. It's not just IPSCs, there's MSCs, there's ESCs. All of them have different functions in the human body. What different functions could they have as a therapeutic modality or even as a growth platform? I mean, organs were mentioned. Um, and it's more not just the final product, but how do we get to the final product? What can be developed along the way? There's, I think, the regenerative medicine field. If you look at the commercial scale, there's two types of product out there. It is a technology or it is a disease um, therapeutic. And both of those streams are developing very rapidly, even though I think disease gets more of a public recognition because you see the outcomes of the patients. So it'll be very interesting. I think, I think we're going to move towards technology more, but I'm biased coming from an engineering background. I think technology development is going to start boosting us and we're just going to see things that we've never seen before. So, yeah. Maybe, maybe you can answer this question as well, uh, Shola. So how can you scale up the production of these therapeutic products? Doesn't the mechanical stress in devices such as STR damage the cells? I mean, I can answer this. Okay, so if you think about it, this is actually a question I had coming into kind of the biochemical engineering field because coming from chemical engineering, you're dealing with chemicals the whole time. They're not alive. It doesn't matter what you put them through. They're just going to come out the same at the very end of it. With cells, you are putting them under stress. 
But if you think about it, in the human body, your cells aren't just existing in a perfectly optimal condition 24 seven, your cells are also being put under stress. Exercise alone, that's putting your muscles under stress. So depending on the type of cell, they'll each have different conditions that they can operate in and grow in optimally. So you use what you know of the biological in vivo conditions to then create a like ex vivo bioreactor condition that will then best suit that type of cell. So stress doesn't hurt them as much as you think it will, basically. And it takes a lot of uh, studying uh, to know, for example, in the STR, you have the impeller. So to know the rate of or the rotation of the impeller, you need to do a lot of studies, collect the cells, test if the cells are still viable, if there is any damage, if there is any receptor damage. So there is a lot of quality attribute and quality control that we need to do. And one of the things um, I forgot to mention is when you do this kind of bioprocessing, while you differentiate your cells, after each point, you have to take a sample and you have to check for safety of your product. And additionally, you, at the end, you have to, before to release the, the product, you have to do like a release test. So you have to check everything. In one of the, so you remember the first IPS uh, clinical trial that I've mentioned. So in that year, we were attending a conference hosted by Professor Yamanaka. And he was like, we have the product to give to the patient. But when we did karyotyping and we, when we did sequencing of the DNA of the final product, we saw that there is a mutation in a non-coding sequence. So, you know, like in non-coding sequence in your DNA, it's not going to affect anything. And he was asking the, uh, the attendee, do you think we should pro process uh, and do the clinical trials? I voted no. Most of the people voted no. And then he was like, yes, I'm not going to risk it. Even if there is a small change in the DNA of the final product, we're not going to give it to the patient. So there is a lot of challenges having the final product safe. Um, you know what's in your final product. The cell is intact. It's expressing whatever you, you, you want it to do. Not only that, when you give it to the patient. So for example, if I'm generating muscle cells and I'm going to give it to the patient, I need to make sure that this muscle cells is contracting when I will give it to the patient. So there is a lot of, there are a lot of challenges uh, still remaining in our field. Yeah, so this is completely random. I don't want to go off track, but could you give a brief uh, insight on CRISPR application and CAR-T therapy? So um, with the emergence of CRISPR-9 uh, technology nowadays, everyone is trying to, so basically when you have CRISPR-9, you can genetically modify certain uh, DNA uh, in your genome. Uh, so nowadays they're trying to see, so instead of having a lentivirus, that carry this kind of receptor for CAR T, what if they can genetically modify these T cells using CRISPR-9? Uh, CRISPR um, and this is an ongoing uh, research happening. Uh, by doing so, you are removing the step of lentivirus. Um, not only the step to create the lentivirus is a whole bioprocessing aspect. Sometimes you can collaborate with other companies. So for example, Oxford Biomedica, produce this HIV lentivirus that they give to Norvartis to produce this kind of car. So there is a lot of companies that are doing different process that can come together uh, to help each other. But if you remove this step of lentivirus, you may reduce the cost a lot. And this is why they're investigating about the effect of um, CRISPR-9 as well. Cheers. Um, sorry, um, I just wanted to <laughs> to to, to, um, to mention that um, it's something I, I normally say at the start of these sessions, but sometimes we go quite deep dive into some of these uh, questions. We do want to reassure you that if you don't understand this, if you're doing an A level and IBAC, when you come, if you if you come and do a degree with us or a postgraduate, we will bring you to the level where you will understand that. That's the purpose of our modules. It's to teach you in a, in, a, in a linear modular way so that you will understand these when it comes to that point in your, in your education uh, and in your, in your journey through university. So if any of this feels slightly beyond your understanding, 
don't worry that's what we do um all, all of our students who need to understand it will understand it exactly we start always from the basic i mean Shola started with me, the regenerative medicine minor coming from chemical engineering. Um, so in the first module, we just teach the biology and the engineering uh, aspect of the modules, because I have people like Shola coming from chemical engineering department, and I have other students coming from medical science that they don't have a lot of engineering background. So we always start uh, from scratch. Any ethic ethical reasoning prevent any research on stem cell and gene therapy? I think nowadays with IPS, they just kind of flag this kind of ethical debate. Um, gene therapy, I think nowadays people are more aware of it and why we're using this kind of uh, gene therapy. Because when they first started it, you can see in all of these magazines kind of like science fiction in which you are creating a new ear or a new body or a new uh, new new person that's why there was a lot of ethical debate but nowadays with the knowledge i think they waived all of these ethical um debate i can see that we haven't got any more questions come in so i, I think i'm just going to finally ask i'm just going to ask on, on the subject of this i'm just going to ask uh, shella and rana to talk about what it actually means doing this subject in a multidisciplinary university because i think it's 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 worth making the point about you know what an institution this is okay let me start coming from international perspective i am lebanese i was born and i did my undergraduate and masters uh, in lebanon we did not have this kind of thinking of manufacturing bioprocessing or even ucl as interdisciplinary I'm a biologist, I will do only biology. I, I will not, uh, for example, collaborate with uh, art and science or let's say architecture to, to do this. Uh, coming here, see the interdisciplinary aspect of UCL. And even we have one of the MSC, we have it's BioID in which um, it's run by Dr. Brenda Parker and then it's at UCL East. They combine the knowledge of the algae um, with the architect and they're doing fantastic job over there. I was, um, I was shocked when, when I saw what they're doing. Even creating this kind of algae, taking it as uh, extracellular matrix to grow cells on it for, for treatment, I was, I was amazed. So this is a good opportunity and we're in central of London and then we have a lot of companies going around and Stephen Inch in Oxford. So we have a lot of collaboration which could help you to develop uh, your way of thinking as well. Shola? Um, I mean, I agree. There's, I mean, there's so much going on at UCL firstly, but I think more than that, if any of you, even if you're at your like applying to undergrad level, there is no right path to take to get to do something that you enjoy. So I, if you told me five years ago that this is what I would be doing now, I, I would have laughed because I, I had no idea. I had no idea this is even an option for me. I think I actually initially, when I finished my A-levels, I applied for chemistry and then on a whim, I changed to chemical engineering. And I do genuinely mean on a whim. I picked a name that had like chemicals in the title because I thought it would be fun. And then after my first year, I got to pick a minor. I didn't even know I could do a minor when I first applied. and Again, I picked, I just picked this because I thought, you know what, this sounds really interesting. I enjoy doing biology in school. And I'm not saying you should do what I did and go on your gut and every single very important decision in your life. But I think a lot of credit should be given to finding things you enjoy, not necessarily at the right time. I think you're forced, you know, to come up with this plan with your life and stick to it. That's very much not the case. And we're now relating it to the multidisciplinary aspect when you're at UCL, you just get so much exposure to what everyone else is doing. It really gives you ideas on what you want to do next. So even doing the minor, I did the minor with loads of engineers, biosciences, biomedical sciences, and then there's even a Bachelor of Arts and Science. And they do pretty interesting stuff as well. They combine, I think, art majors with science minors, if I'm correct, or the other way around. You pick various different pathways and even talking to them, I realized how so many different people get into this field 
simply because they recognize that it's something they're passionate about. And I think that's very important. You, it really helps when you're around so many different people from so many different backgrounds to learn what actually makes you tick. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you to someone who's posted the last question. You put it in the chat. So um, I'll, I'll just read it out. That's OK. So um, they're asking about neuro regeneration. Since beside neurons, there are also plenty of glial cells connecting and supporting neurons or regenerating neurons. Uh, are there some ways for connections to be rebuilt? You are expecting that. So it depends. So some of the products they give, for example, if I'm interested in dopaminergic neuron, I will give only dopaminergic neuron. Uh, sometimes they combine it with other types of neuron, other type of cells to support that. But you are, um, and sometimes we add some growth factor that can promote that. So you add growth factor to promote, for example, cell, uh, cell expansion or cell differentiation. But you are expecting that when you give neurons to the patient, it will settle down and expand and then um, take its shape. So it should do the connection. That's why it is very important to do cl preclinical trials on rat to see when you're going to give the rat, this, uh, this, the animal, this kind of cells, will they attach and do the connections or not? Yeah. Perfectly on time, Rana. Um, like like a, a like an anchor in a news program. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Listen, um, thank, you. thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for those questions. They they were they were outstanding questions. Really enjoyed answering those. Um, Rana, great to have you here. Shola, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I really look forward to everybody joining us for the next uh, Spring to STEM lecture. Uh, it'd be great to see you again. Um, and if you come to us in person, come and make sure you come and say hello and come and see us on the open days. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. I hope you enjoy this as much as we have.